Okay, section 5.4, intercultural dialogue between critics of their own culture. Dialogue between critics of their own culture. All right, now this is the kind of dialogue we want to have. This is philosophical dialogue uh, in the tradition of Socrates. This is a Euro, you know, this is part of Eurocentric philosophy is only dialogue, the only dialectic, as Socrates liked to call it, was a dialectic in which you're critical of others, but most importantly, critical of yourself. Um, this intercultural dialogue is neither only nor principally a dialogue between cultural apologists that attempt to demonstrate to others the virtues and values of their own culture. It is, above all, a dialogue between a, cultural's, a culture's critical innovators and intellectuals of the border between their culture and modernity. It is not a dialogue among those who merely defend their culture from Enemies, but rather among those who recreate it, depart from the critical assumptions found in their own cultural tradition and in that of globalizing modernity. Modernity can serve as a critical catalyst if it is used by the expert hand of critics of their own culture. But additionally, this is not even the dialogue between the critics of the metropolitan core and the critics of the cultural periphery. It is more than anything a dialogue between the critics of the periphery. It must be an intercultural South-South dialogue before it can become a South-North dialogue. So the self-criticisms of Latin America, self-criticisms of A Africa, the self-criticisms of India, the self-criticism of China, uh, Indonesia, etc., uh, Philippines, this is the the dialogue that needs to take place first, apart from those in the core, the Eurocentric people, <clears throat> because there can be, uh, because there is a, a symmetry that exists south-south that does not exist between north and south, right? <clears throat> uh, and, and, then, and then notice, uh, again, that this is all about self-criticism. If you're not self-criticizing, you don't get it. If you are just trying to defend your position against some other and you're criticizing another person's culture or another person's uh, liberatory movement, uh, as I've seen in some of the essays, you know, don't worry about other people's movements. What is your thing? What are you trying to do that is moving forward, that is maturing, that is evolving, that is living and doing something. How, how does that unfold? Uh, if you are just arguing against another uh, cultural perspective, then you are uh, stagnating. Uh, and, and, and in your own culture. Um, it's through, and, and, and Dussel, you know, he's saying that it, the only way that any culture grows and moves forward is through confrontation with other cultures. But this is a confrontation in which both sides of the confronta confrontation, at least the, 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 most, uh, the most fruitful confrontations, are confrontations where both parties are being self-critical and trying to assimilate the view of the other as much as possible. And that's very hard for a hegemonic, asymmetric overlord uh, to do. Um, but, um, but, you know, that is a, a very gracious and admirable quality to actually listen to people that have less power than you. And of course, this is emphasized very much by Gutierrez and Romero, that it's the poor who know what's up. It's not the rich. If the rich want to be part of the kingdom, they can become poor too, but we got we to gotta be on the side of the poor and we got to listen to them because 
according to Jesus, you know, in their religious weird way of thinking, Jesus said, the poor shall inherit uh, the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor. Uh, so they're the ones we have to listen to and follow. Uh, <clears throat> and this is a very Christian attitude to to humble yourself before those that you might, through liberal bourgeois capitalistic culture, believe is inferior to you. Uh, but if you can really listen to them and find resources that allow you to be effectively self-critical, then that's that's really that's really a moment of growth. This sort of dialogue is essential, South-South. As a Latin American philosopher, I would like to begin a conversation with Al Yabri, beginning from the following question. Why did Islamic philosophical thought fall into such a profound crisis after the 14th century? This cannot be explained merely by the slow and growing presence of the Ottoman Empire. Why did this philosophy enter the blind alley of fundamentalist thought? It is necessary to lend a hand through a border world historical interpretation in order to understand that the Islamic world, after having been key to contact with the ancient world from Byzantium to a lesser degree Latin Germanic Europe to Hindustan and China, would slowly but inevitably be left outside the central zone of contact with other universal cultures by the constitution of an ocean-based world system under Spanish and Portuguese domination. Uh, so that's kind of interesting is what one explanation for the demise of Arabic philosophy and its descent into fundamentalism and, and not being self-critical, um, being reactionary and non-revolutionary, non-moving forward in history. Um, is that the Spanish and Portuguese sort of went around them on the oceans and left that Middle East uh, no longer the central crossroads of all trade between East and West. Uh, the trade happened over the oceans and kind of skipped over. The Middle East kind of became a, a sail-by portion, like we talk about um, the middle of the United States. Sometimes politicians are are, are accused of thinking of middle America geographically as, as flyover states, that states that you fly over from east coast to west coast and just you kind of ignore um, the people in the country. The Middle East kind of became that way once um, the world system of ocean uh, trade uh, became established by the Spanish and the Portuguese in the 16th century in the 1500s. Um, again, a century before Descartes. The loss of centrality and with it information, the relative impoverishment, even if only for the inflation of silver due to the extraction of massive quantities from Latin America, as well as other non-cultural and non-philosophical factors, plunged the Arab world into peripheral poverty. This led to a political factionalism and isolationism that tribalized it, disintegrating into destructive separatisms, the ancient reason once unified by law and Arab language. This philosophical decadence was only a moment in a broader civilizational decadence of the economic, political, and military crisis of a world transformed from core to periphery. The Islamic Caliphate was the center of the world, not only geographically, because it literally was. Baghdad was right down smack in the middle between China and, and Europe. Um, and But with this globalized sea travel, Baghdad's no longer the center geographically uh, because the map has been redrawn by, by thinking of uh, ocean travel, and, and even thinking about, oh, we, uh, we really then conceive of the world as a globe. Uh, this was known before then, but, but, um, but uh, with ocean travel, that becomes much more solidified in everyone's mind. 
uh, and then the Islamic Caliphate and the Ottoman Empire as its, as its later stage is not the center of the world system. It's not the core of the world political economic system. It's now on the periphery and Europe is the center. But it's at this time that the shift happens and it happens in 1492 that the caliphate begins to fall into obscurity because Portugal and Spain are making Europe the central core political economic region. It is therefore necessary to link, for example, the history of the Islamic world with the world system, with Latin America, and with the growth of European modernity, which through 1800 was in cultural terms as important as Hindu Chinese culture. In the 19th century, that is to say after the Industrial Revolution, this would even allow the colonialization of the Arab world. Cultural coloniality is expressed philosophically as philosophical decadence. Um, and so he's saying the philosophical decadence of Arab philosophy in this period is a, an effect of colonization and the way in which bourgeois liberal core modernity uh, negates uh, and 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 uh, annihilates uh, other cultures. Salazar Bondi posed a similar question in 1969. Is it possible to think philosophically and creatively from the position of, colo of colonial being? Can you be a philosopher in a colonialized context from a peripheral country? In the case of Rigoberto Menchu, the most productive dialogue was realized between the critics of different communities, excuse me, and between those of the indigenous communities and critical elements of the mestizo world and of hegemonic Latin America. Menchu was transformed into an interlocutor of many voices, of many claims by feminists, ecologists, anti-racist movements, etc. All right, so Minshew actually experimented with intercultural dialogue, but periphery to periphery, not worried about North America or European central or bourgeois intellectuals, but looking at being critical of communities she was in proximity to. Intercultural dialogue brings about a transversal and a mutual cross-fertilization among the critical thinkers of the periphery and those from border spaces and the organization of networks to discuss their own specific problems transforms this process of self-affirmation into a weapon of liberation. We should inform ourselves and learn from the failures, the achievements, and the still theoretical justification of the creative process in the face of the globalization of European North American culture, whose pretense of universality must be deconstructed from the optical multifocality of each culture. All right, so <laughs> core. Um, so uh, Manchu and others provide examples that we can learn from on how to be self-critical. Uh, and be self-affirming and self-affirmation is liberatory because then you become an agent in the evolution of your own culture. Again, thinking of the peripheral, secondary, the poor versus, you know, as opposed to the powerful as being a historical agent in history. And, um, and looking uh, uh, and, and being able to deconstruct hegemonic liberal bourgeois um, enlightenment and philosophy from the multiple perspectives that exist on the periphery. And when you have periphery to periphery discussions, you can get multiple angles on the core culture um, that give it a, give a better analysis of it all very valuable, not only for intellectuals on the periphery, but also for those of us who, who are in the core. Um, we need this insight. 